it's my absolute uh, privilege to be seated in front of the the best known uh, liver transplant surgeon in India and a good friend Subhash Gupta. Welcome. Thank you. <laughs> Dr. Radhakrishnan, or shall I call you Patta? Patta, but uh, I'll call you Dr. Radhakrishnan. <laughs> That's formal, very formal. Okay, okay. <laughs> Radhakrishnan, I will go. We were associated in the contemporaries, I should say, in the All India Institute of Medical Sciences under the famous Dr. Samaran Nandi when uh, he was uh, eating, sleeping, drinking liver transplantation. It is very much on his mind and uh, uh, Subhash Gupta was uh, sort of uh, uh, one of the persons in his dreams uh, uh, to make this thing come true in India, which I think he lived his dreams. And, yeah. um, Subhash, um, where do you belong to? Where was your schooling, college, etc.? I came from a very small town. You probably not heard of it. Uh, it's in West Bengal. Uh, it's Asansol. But the only thing good about Asansol is that in those days, in the sort of, it was a railway town, and in the British era, there were very good schools there. And my father was posted in interiors, was had a transferable job as it was the fashion those days for government jobs. And my grandfather was an astute gentleman, I must say. I owe all of my uh, what I am today to him. He insisted that I should stay with him in Nasansol and join one of these uh, schools uh, which was English medium school and good, good teachers and that is how I, I think uh, so I'm lucky in many ways to have got the break that I uh, got because obviously without that background and uh, students from it was a boarding school in those days so some of the best students came from Calcutta mainly and then you could interact with them and you know when you are in a group of people who all have the same dream then everyone does better apart from one person so i'm actually quite fortunate to have studied there and then from there on moved on to qualified for the medical entrance and went on to delhi uh, in all india institute but that also was a very uh, strange event because uh, my parents would be from being from bengal they thought that uh, Delhi is a city of, you know, not a good city to live in as compared to Calcutta. So, I got admission in Calcutta Medical College also and uh, being immature, I actually joined Calcutta Medical College till I met some friends there and they said if you get a opening in Delhi, you should take that rather than in Calcutta and I am wise, I am glad that I took that decision and ended up being what I, what I am today. No, but uh, wasn't it uh, a, a new environment, uh, a, a very, uh, you know, a very difficult environment. Mm -hmm. New, it was very difficult environment. Those days, uh, ragging used to be bad. I hear that ragging is almost finished now. Yeah. But then in those days, and uh, because being from so far away, no friends, family in Delhi. So weekends, I used to go and sit in the railway station was to save to save myself from my seniors would be <laughs> after we with but uh, uh, of course that's the sort of other side of ragging but the good side is in the end those people also became good friends later on so there's one positivity as well as negativity as so so much i mean that is the case often in life where you have both the things coexisting but for for us for me in that time just uh, out of class 12 in delhi uh, language is different uh, people are different norms are different and uh, uh, so you know I, I first two three months I found it very very difficult and I thought maybe I should go back to you know Asansol and study in Calcutta where you know the entire family is there and till I think one of our senior uh, colleagues who used to live in my same hostel he took me aside and tried to uh, put some sense in me he said that this is temporary and you will uh, you know it'll soon uh, enjoy it and maybe next year you will be doing the same ragging other <laughs> students. <laughs> you did? <laughs> I did, I did, I did. I thought it was, I had a very bad experience uh, for my, for me it was uh, not pleasant at all. Well, were you a very good student as an undergraduate or uh, you know, ah, uh, that took life a, easy? That was a, again a big problem because you know, you qualified and then everyone's qualified, then everyone's been uh, top elsewhere and suddenly you find that amongst all these people you are so you start wondering whether you are actually any good or not because the others are so much uh, you know better so i think at that stage it's important to realize that uh, everyone comes with their own uh, sort of background 
and uh, uh, as long as you are sincere, honest and keep working towards your goal, eventually you will reach your goal, not look at, you know, every person who looks at another person, he may think that that person is better, richer or more smarter, but in the end we all have our own qualities and we should focus on it and develop that rather than look at what others have. And if you keep developing your own quality, eventually one day you will end up being what you what you want to be. So it's not books all the time. Uh, definitely not uh, books because I think uh, what we did there was uh, very. Uh, they had a nice uh, gym. They had a swimming pool in that college, and so we did, played a lot of badminton, played uh, swimming and basketball as well. So overall it was a, a complete development there. But one of the best things there was that the, after that of course the ragging period was over one month after that then you made friends with these seniors who were all kind of pursuing the same dream of becoming uh, famous. But at the same time they didn't want to let go of the opportunity to have a good time. So there was social events as well, parties and uh, things like that. And of course, sometimes of course things went a bit out of control because uh, if you're not careful, then you could uh, get get into alcoholism and uh, you know uh, drugs. But you have to be a little bit careful. You sometimes you have to say uh, yes when you actually meant no, and then somehow get out of that situation rather than trying to confront it head on and say that no, I will not drink and I will not smoke. I won't do drugs. But you just go along with it. But keep your mind completely clear that uh, this is not for you, this will get you back. Any particular subject you developed a liking during MBBS? Uh, I was very uh, fascinated by being a cardiac surgeon because uh, uh, cardi cardiology interested me. I learnt all the murmurs through all the tapes. I think Merck Sharp and Dom used to produce those audio tapes in those right, days. Right. And I used to listen and try to, you know, learn S1, S2. Because all these things became later on when echo, echocardiography came, all became sort of a little bit redundant. I had developed a strong liking for cardiology. I went and spent uh, uh, three months or maybe six months with Dr. Venu Gopal, who was one of the sort of pioneers of uh, cardiac surgery in North India. And, but somehow I found the environment a little bit, uh, a little bit restrictive. We were not uh, completely open. So then I, the only, the only other new area that was coming up was uh, surgical gastroenterology, which Dr. Nandi was developing. And I thought maybe I should go into that because always good to go into an area where there are less people, less competition, because you can then shine. So I tried to stay away from two two areas with a lot of people are there. So you take an area which is new, which is less competition, then eventually, however difficult that area may be, eventually you will, uh, when you reach your goal, you'll be, you will have done something major and substantial with your life. So effectively, uh, the cardiac surgery or GI surgery, is surgery which is on your mind. Surgery was on Any mind. reason, uh, because I always feel that uh, Fellows choose surgery of the ones who are slightly weak at reading, memory and they are not really the intellectual types who have to mug up medical books. Yeah, that is true. In fact, uh, if I were to say the truth, then the, all the bright chaps were applying for medicine and I thought I will have a better chance in getting surgery. But uh, this is the sort of lighter side of things. But I thought surgery was something you did. Uh, uh, you did something and uh, whatever you did, your effort would dramatically transform somebody's life. Whereas in medicine sometimes, uh, particularly in those days, interventional uh, uh, stuff had not been developed. For example, uh, ophthalmology was mainly thought of as a person who you know, makes you wear glasses. Nobody knew that it would go into such a great uh, sort of technology and great uh, uh, sort of advances there. Nobody also thought of uh, uh, gastroenterology with so much interventional work happening there or interventional radiology. So, uh, surgery seemed at that time that something you could do dramatically with your own self and make a difference immediately to a person's life. So, obviously that fascinated me to surgery. But there are multiple factors and I do not think really uh, I was committed to surgery in the beginning. But after having joined it, I really enjoyed uh, the sort of uh, uh, the fact interaction with patients, the difference that you made to their life and persons going to surgery very, very sort of 
uh, disturbed and then coming out of surgery very happy and that would make me happy as well. So that's how I persisted after my in, uh, you know uh, short uh, uh, rotation in surgery. I said I must go on and do surgery later on in life. Now, uh, were you any different from the others while you are in a surgical trainee that uh, made you what you are? Is, is it, are you were like anybody else? No, I think uh, what, uh, uh, what I found in surgery was that, uh, first of all, you have to accept the slow process of it. There is no way you can fast track it. The, and you do what is assigned to you. And little by little, you observe others and while you operate, while somebody else is operating, you just see how he is doing, what, what he is doing, have your attention focused on hand movements, where he places the instrument and kind of keep uh, seeing how it is being done. So that and in the mind, you know, in the mind you are actually doing the operation, although you are assisting, but in the mind you are actually doing it. And this I keep telling all our younger colleagues also that and one day when your turn comes to do and if you do not do it the way your supervisor, I would not call him boss, the supervisor done it, then he may not feel committed to giving you more stuff. But if you do it exactly the way he does it and he copy it, he will feel confident and next day you will get something more to do and something more, you know, so that, so in a short while it will cumulatively add up. So, it may seem very frustrating for a while, but you just observe what the person is doing and you reproduce it again when you get an opportunity and someday an opportunity immediately will come to you, either the person is sick or there is too much work or whatever, that opportunity will come to you and when that comes, you must seize that opportunity. And how about uh, reading theory, uh, spending time in the wards, I mean, did you do anything extra? Yeah, I think uh, you had to spend a lot of time on the ward because I think uh, one of the issues is as uh, famous uh, clinical uh, handbook of medicine uh, says that if you have not seen it, your mind will not recognize it and if you have only read about it, you will not see it. So, you have to do both. So, I think uh, I keep seeing that pattern recognition and seeing things and little, little, little detail, attention to detail will help you a lot in becoming. Uh, so, just by reading alone, uh, I think it is just not possible to be a surgeon. You have to learn from your patients whether your intervention helped him. If, and listen, I think you have to be empathetic, uh, you have to uh, listen to them very every word they say, you have to listen to it because only then you will end up becoming what you are. You will get a real time feedback on the intervention that you have done for them, has it been of help or not. So, it is very important to not, I mean, it is good to sort of write papers and all, but at the same time, patient care. Uh, uh, will make you a better surgeon, there is no doubt about that. Uh, how was your relationship with your bosses, your the senior, with your juniors, is it extra special? Yeah, I think the first surgical teacher is Professor L.K. Sharma and one thing I can tell you and all his students will tell you, be he in his three year period, he would take you through one procedure of three, four procedures he had in mind always, one was a hernia a cholecystectomy, one was a pyelolithotomy and one was a mastectomy. He made sure all his PGs went through these four procedures he, with him standing as the first assistant, first assistant. And I think this is remarkable. I think I have seen very few teachers who have been like this. Although, uh, you know, he is not a very, uh, he was an excellent surgeon, but uh, I sometimes feel he did not get enough credit as he should have got. But as a teacher and you can, you know, you can ask any of his students, he would do that to every of his people's graduate residents. And I think, uh, and this is something that I try and do to all or before they leave us, our fellows leave us, I ask them something that you are not confident about doing. And I said, I will take you through that procedure so that, you know, you have nothing to, uh, you know, so that your training is complete. So, that was my relation with uh, Professor Sharma and later on when I uh, uh, worked with Dr. Nandi was my uh, trainee in GI surgery, uh, GI surgery, he was, I mean, he was a man with uh, immense uh, uh, ability both in writing, as an intellectual, uh, as a, train, a trainer. So, from him I learnt a lot and a great, great uh, sort of fascination and I, in fact, he was instrumental in getting me a job in Birmingham, which is which is what gave me a break to go on to become a liver transplant surgeon. Because he and Paul McMaster were together in Cambridge, and at his uh, request was taken on as a fellow. 
and from then on it of course went on become a good relationship uh, with him and also I think uh, uh, Paul McMaster in Birmingham he was one of the finest teachers that I have come across one day he uh, I was in theatre with him and he says uh, have you done any laparoscopic cholecystectomy I said laparoscopic I don't think, think even I can spell that word so he <laughs> said no no now you have to do it and this is 92 and so he you know he held the camera and I kept sort of Finger, you know, my hands were shaking, I was past pointing and the, I had very poor hand eye quality because I never touched that damn thing. And But he was that kind of a man. One day I think there was some Swiss surgeon whose name I've forgotten, it cut the bile duct and I thought this man is going to come to theatre and really, really shout at him and you know everybody and we all scared. But he came to theatre and he said, listen, you can only do this once and that's all he said. <laughs> And then he repaired it and of, of course the patient went home. From then on moved on to... Uh, uh, no, I'll, I'll, I'll come to it uh, slowly because we, I don't want, don't want to do because people need to know what happened in between. Now, uh, uh, why did Nandi choose you uh, in preference to many others uh, to put you to, to transplant? Uh, what uh, sort of... Uh, what, how, how were you special? Uh, I think uh, in Dr. Nandi had a habit, which I don't know whether other surgeons have it or not. I do it in the morning, but he used to do it in the night. Just before sleeping, he would want an update on all the patients. And I think he was always very happy with the way I gave him update. And so, I mean, I rarely remember him being, uh, you know, upset. And I know people, uh, my colleagues were a bit... Uh, they were very nervous about this update that they had to give over the patient in the night. And I don't know whether he did that with you or not, but he used to make sure that I give him update. If I was on call before sleep, uh, before he went off to sleep, he would want to update on all the patients. I would give him all the updates. And my updates were generally right. So I think he was happy with me because he could have a sound sleep knowing that patients <laughs> are doing well. Right. So that was, I think, uh, my relationship with him. Mm. And of course, uh, uh, I did help him a lot. Uh, I, mean, I mean, he made everyone help him because he was one of those persons who could extract work out from everybody. And he sent me to Calcutta once to organize this conference on brainstem death, and which ultimately led to the Recreational Transplant Act. Then uh, I think he helped me sort of we put that book together. Then an MGI work. So I, whatever work was assigned to me, mm -hmm. I did it without any. Uh, complaint or, and did it diligently. I, th I thought it was in my best interest. Of course, I wasn't uh, trying to please him, but I thought that if work has been given to me, either you get out and go away, but if it's being uh, given to you and expected of you, you should do it nicely and, on, uh, nicely and uh, you know, without creating any issues. But if you don't like some place and you're not happy with it, then much better to go away rather than to do a shoddy work while staying within the system. I think that's a very significant point that he should do what your boss likes, boss yeah. wants, yeah. the way he yeah. wants, yeah. the way he yeah. likes yeah. it, yeah. 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 and uh, without any showing of any yeah. sort of. Uh, yeah. uh, because scorn. it's a free world. If you don't like it, you know, you're free to go wherever. But ra right. rather than cribbing within the system and complaining and not doing it, you're disturbing the system, that, that actually you know, will bring you unhappiness, but also bring unhappiness to the rest of the department and unit. Do you judge your uh, trainees the same way? Uh, I think we are now in a slightly different world. So nowadays, like for example, uh, you know, the our bosses would tell us that, oh, I've been on for 48 hours, 56 hours continuously. But I think the new generation, uh, you have to honor their requirements as well. So if they've done a night, they've been on call night, on uh, then next day they'll get off. But I've accepted that. But at the same time, I've, you know, few things I, I've not uh, changed at all for, from what it was previously. That you must be upfront with me, honest with me. If you don't like something, you must tell me. I'll try and correct it if I can. If I can't, then you have to either accept it or you have to, you know, find some other place of working. And whatever is given to you, whatever responsibility is given to you, do it. And when, when you say you're going to do it, you must mean that you are going to do it, not say yes for the purposes of saying yes and you know like we have this great uh, sort of Indian trait where we say yes when we actually mean no. But it's much better to say no upfront than to, than to say yes and mean no. So, and, and I'm lucky actually to have some of the best fellows with us 
in the past and in fact we run a CLBS alumni group which is sort of very active and uh, we keep track of each other's progress and uh, we had a very good relationship with them even after they've left us and uh, I think the some of the old principles are equally valid even now in this new world but uh, I think uh, one must realize that nothing comes easily there's lot and lot of effort goes in slowly brick by brick uh, edifice will build up but if you think that uh, you know edifice will build up overnight then it's you know you're in for dis disappointment well you remember those days of monkey liver surgery where i used to help you with the yeah. <laughs> monkey lab and something in the forensic uh, department yeah, yeah. That, that, that those were good days as well because you uh, well, in GI surgery, one of the things that was important, which is different from other surgeries was because we did a lot of shunt surgery, so automatically you end up doing, becoming a vascular surgeon, which was uh, sometimes not so well developed in other areas of uh, surgery at that time. So the monkey, these are monkeys who were, in those days, and even now actually we don't have a vaccine for hepatitis C. So there, there were scientists who were working on uh, on these monkeys to develop a vaccine for hepatitis C and these monkeys were going to be sacrificed. I'm, I'm not sure whether that's the right word or not, but they're going to be killed after the experiment. So Dr. Nandi made an arrangement with the, the, these people that before you kill them, why don't we just do uh, liver transplantation on them. And uh, uh, the, so that, it was really good because there used to be anesthesia, there was anesthetics, there was proper monitoring. We had two set of monkeys, we'd take out the liver and sometimes the new transplanted liver would make a bile and we'd all be happy, we'd be also give them immunosuppression. So all in all, it was very, very uh, good days. The, the veterinary doctor in charge of the animal house was also became a very good friend and we did, in fact, not only monkey work, we, there's Dr. Shinoy who's now in Washington, he used to do these uh, experiments with nitroprusside and small rats and they're the most fragile uh, sort of uh, animals I've seen, uh, you do anything wrong and they would immediately die. So the trick was to ensure that they, you know, survive the experiment. So we did a lot, I think we did 13 pairs of monkeys and many of them actually lived uh, four or five days after the transplantation. Yeah. Mm. Now, um, where you, uh, uh, how was your uh, uh, initial days in the UK, was it any different? The initial days in UK was a little bit again a uh, major stress point because uh, I got a job in the transplant unit and there in those days in 93-94 uh, the liver surgeon was also expected, the liver surgeon was also expected to do kidney work and uh, so I had very little experience of kidney work there and uh, so then I had to learn that up quickly, how to make fistulas, how to put CAPD catheters, how to... So that was a little bit stressful point, but I'm glad that I picked it up. One trick uh, uh, was told to me by one of my colleagues that uh, be friendly with the operating room nurses and they'll actually tell you how to do the operation. So that helped me a lot. So I would, in, in, any time in doubt, I would ask them what to do and they would tell, oh, do it like this, Mr. So-and-so does it like this. I would just copy the steps. And also, uh, when you're on call, uh, sometimes some things that we don't see in India that much, particularly if you're trained in a big multi-speciality tertiary hospital, things like uh, appendicitis and torsion testes, because you had to act immediately and you could not uh, sit on it. There was no investigation. So when you're on call that night and somebody came with perforation, you had to deal with immediately. There's no diagnostic. There's no CT scan and nothing, so I had to do a lot of things on a clinical basis. And there were little stressful points for me in the beginning. But uh, anyway, I was uh, lucky that I picked them up uh, quickly by, uh, you know, I think it was just being uh, uh, nice to people, then people also nice to you. The nurses and the OT nurses and the ward nurses they would guide you how to go about things. Because I think uh, the few things which are very unique about that country, our UK by train. What is that the intern who comes to the ward, he is a master of all the basic things. He can read an ECG, he can take an ECG, he can put a Venflon without, because they have been do, doing this throughout their uh, clinical training, which is something that 
uh, probably does not, I don't know how, how it is in Chennai, mm. but the houseman who came to the ward would actually be able to take an ECG and read an ECG and know which is normal, for which he needs to call help. So, the, the, so these are some of the skills I had to pick up very quickly there to be, you know, apart from my own skills as a surgeon, but you had to be overall no basic medicine completely. Was life very difficult in uh, days, in the early days? In the in UK. But at the time you thought, okay, I should go back. Uh, this is too no, UK me. was very good days. I think apart from the minor stresses which I highlighted where something like torsion testes was, would not be handled by urologists. It will be handled by the person. And you know, you had to make the clinical judgment whether it's epididymocytis or, you know, you wouldn't. And invariably it would happen on a weekend. You can't get ultrasonologists. Nobody you can get. You are on your own. So, these are little stressful points. But overall, the, the work environment environment there was amazing because you got weekends off, you would be one weekend on call and three weekends somebody else would be on call and you of course got a lot of money. So, so in the beginning everything looked nice but I think sooner or later uh, you start missing your country for whatever reason and that's the time when you know I thought when the children are not yet grown up, I thought uh, you know must try uh, go back to India. There's absolutely my wife is a British citizen. We could have stayed on there forever and had a good job. In fact, some of the best relationship I still have with my uh, with Paul McMaster, with John Buckles, and uh, with uh, Peter Lodge and Steve Pollard, and uh, and I could have stayed on. But I'm glad I took the decision to come here because it's been a a tough journey here, but every uh, f uh, very fulfilling all the way through. What made you come back? Is it that you have that what Dr. Nandi says is that feeling for serving the poor or what may are you take care of your parents or somebody? Uh, what, what makes because you are you are comfortable enough and uh, I think or is it your wife wanted you to? No, 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 no. Wives always want to stay abroad I think. <laughs> they, <laughs> how how could you go against good, the wishes? <laughs> good life. But I think they want to stay abroad because it's very, uh, it's, life is very organized there and you know, uh, Spouses like a very, if I want to be politically correct, I say I should say partners. Partners like a very organized life rather than uh, disorganized life. There's chaos in India, there's complete madness, you know. Uh, so, but the reason I think for me, the main reason was that uh, I think one thing was there that I would only remain a, tra a consultant, transplant surgeon, uh, perhaps not. A, HBB surgeon or a GI surgeon for which I had a lot of training and I was still fascinated by it. Uh, so, because the way the, because I had not trained there, not and I wasn't uh, a local person or hadn't trained in sort of done the specialist rotation. So, I ended up being, I would have ended up being just being a transplant surgeon. I thought that uh, one cannot do transplant surgery all throughout. And I also thought that I would be there and uh, I would be one of many transplant surgeons in that country. Whereas liver transplantation is still evolving, I think some work had happened, but n nothing major. I thought if I could crack it in India, then obviously it'll be good for me. So that was my thoughts. I wouldn't say that I wanted to uh, serve poor people, but yes, of course, I wanted to be close to my family, my parents, and uh, I think in the end, uh, you know, in the end of the day, only friends and family matters. And I think very little to do with money, very little to do with the clean air or running water or safe roads. In the end, what matters is family and friends when you, you know, when you sit back and you have a problem and you look at things only, you know, those, those are the important th things in life. Beyond that, I don't think there is, you know, um, anything else that is more important than friends and family and I am saying that repeatedly. <laughs> that is one special stage of yeah, life. Yeah. But when you know very well that there is no uh, proper position in India, there is no transplantation going on, nothing, but this is going to be a huge challenge. How could you take that uh, risk and were you mentally prepared that you are going to yeah, face the yeah, challenge? Yeah. So, what I did was I, I had that in mind and of course, you are absolutely right, many people came and went back as well and I had also made that provision. So, I had my, I had kept my GMC registration active, I had my stuff from England in storage and uh, two years I must say the number of times I did think I would uh, go back. But I think what happened was that uh, uh, 
twice I went to because of of course the money that I was getting from my job in India was not enough to even pay my rent. So two or three times I went to do, do locum jobs in UK, but somehow I found that being alone there, uh, the, the, the locum paid well, but it just didn't make me happy. So I think at, at one then what happened was then I had permanent stay for UK, so I allowed that to lapse so that I was no longer tempted to go there ever again. So once that happened, then I started looking at uh, how I can make myself uh, popular here. So what I started uh, doing was that you know, the patients who were, they were not my patients, my patients uh, because I was an unknown person in that country and you know, you have the best of degrees, best of qualification in India, unless you are famous, nobody comes to you. And in fact, this is one of the problems I f is find that the newer people who are students are coming, who are getting into private practice in private sector, they are going to have a tough time. And I keep saying that to those who have qualified MCH and all, they should be allowed to work in a government hospital as well as private, ho private hospital. Because then you can only make a name and fame if you have enough patients to look after. If you don't have enough patients to look after, you cannot make a name and fame. I was lucky that Dr. Nandi had a good practice and he, I didn't tell the patient that with, I had anything to do with them. I used to say that you're Dr. Nandi's patient. But I used to look after their sort of requirements, somebody in pain or somebody in... So they uh, started recognizing me and when they uh, needed the medical help, they started seeking me out. And in that way, gradually, my actually my uh, practice improved. Otherwise, in the beginning, it was so really what is it? What is it in you that they liked, the patients liked? See, when you are in trouble and anybody who can listen to with a sympathetic voice, that, that person will always remember you. And little things that you do, for example, there was one patient I remember, I met him, I met the family in some function. They used to ask me, um, you may not remember me, uh, but I remember you very, I said, you know, I was a little bit afraid, or, you know, whether what happened, maybe I had done something wrong. Because, you know, the medical practice is not always uh, good, sometimes bad things do happen. So I said, uh, you know, I told him, you know, no, I, those days I was a junior consultant, I was not the main man. So he said, no, 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 it's not that. I know that. I know. I, I said, uh, he said, I know all that. You came in the morning. Everybody was saying for uh, operation. You, came, you, you took me aside. I said, why don't we wait for a few hours? Let me, you know, come back and see you in the evening. And he came in the evening on your own. You saw the child and he said he didn't need an operation. I think he just had some pain and everyone was advising him appendicitis. And I said, you know, I, in the evening I examined him and he was completely pain-free, comfortable. I said, you know, you don't need an operation. So you remember that. And subsequently I know that this person ha has actually any medical problem he referred to me. So th these are little things that, you know, you can... Uh, uh, I think there's one way you can get patient by being showing exceptional skill, but then all of us are very talented and everyone has exceptional skill. But sometimes what we don't have is the human qualities of right. listening to other people and acting on it right. and making them feel as if they're your own. Now, uh, there's a person who's getting trained in transplant in the UK and uh, he wants to continue there and there's a person who wants to come back to India. Now, is in the learning process, will there be any different uh, that, you know, is to be mentally prepared to learn more or you know, something As far different? as uh, liver transfer is concerned, somebody is <coughs> training in UK, I think if he comes to India, he'll have a tough time because most of this work in our country is now living related, 80% of transfer. So, anyone who is working in liver transfer in this country, has to be skilled in liver transplant in living related transplantation. Whereas for a person who's done living related transplant, for him to make a transition to cadaveric transplantation is relatively easy. So your question is that if you're working in UK, perhaps if he comes here, spends uh, 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 three, four months in a busy unit, then he can of course very quickly uh, get into liver transplantation. But I think he will need to spend a uh, few months and we've had many people like that. I think uh, some of the names I can think of is Ravi Chand who was in uh, Ireland for many years and then he spent uh, six months with us. Then there's Dongre in Pune. Again, he was trained in UK but he came here, spent time with us and now they're all doing really good work. One is in Pune, one is in, uh, uh, I think in Bangalore as well. There's one in Hyderabad. Many of these people have trained abroad but now after having spent time with us, polished their li living donor liver transplant skills and they are doing their own practice very well. What are the initial difficulties you faced after go coming to India? I'll tell you the background. See, there will always be somebody above 
and that somebody above would not like have a competition if that somebody is al almost a similar age then you know there is no yeah. way how could you get over yeah this is a very good question because uh, you know sometimes it's like a chess game sometimes you have to uh, uh, sacrifice upon and sacrifice a ego for a while just to improve your overall status uh, overall situation for example you know uh, th there are many types of people, there are people who will like to take credit for everything, people who would like to project themselves as the main person. But uh, if in the end, if overall good is being done, then eventually you will also get your recognition, no even if you, uh, even if you felt that the other person is stealing the limelight or not stealing the limelight, and you, you know you are, but eventually you will, if you are actually, uh, you have looked after your patients well, you have uh, patients that you've been loyal to your patients, patients will recognize your effort and sooner or later you, you will get your uh, sort of uh, whatever your position that you uh, But how long for. will you wait? Yeah, you know, because this generation doesn't want to wait. This is a big problem. I think, I think sometimes I, I wonder that the olden system whereby uh, and it will come back, I'm pretty sure that where apprenticeship, you were, you were associated with surgeon and both of you, in fact, uh, it was a bit like, you know, music directors, two music, music directors. I know famous one in uh, sort of uh, Bombay, There's, they used to call him Lakshmi Kant Pyar, and uh, they used to think he's a single person. So, I think that system perhaps should come back. This system where you have no, uh, no control on whom you are going to come to you for training, the board will decide that there's no interview system anymore. And that person is there with you three years and those three years he may not, he may disagree with you most of the time and he then goes away. And uh, yes, there is a problem but I think uh, over the years I have seen in the hospitals that I have worked with, I have worked in three private hospitals in this country now, uh, Gangaram, Apollo and, Ma and Max now. I have seen that sooner or later the younger person, uh, he, he once he's developed all the skills, very easily he can branch out and do his own. Or if he feels happy, he can stay on with the, with the old people. But yes, uh, getting it immediately in medicine is slow process. But you must remember that medicine does not have a expiry date. It does not have a retirement date. Expiry date, yes, but it does not have a retirement date. So, actually, with each passing year, you, you are going to be sought more and more, unlike the uh, IT guys or the investment bankers because, you know, I find many of them have retired at the age of 40, but actually your life will begin at the age of 40 as a doctor and a surgeon. And from then on, you can actually keep on building. And even if you are not uh, sort of actively working, you will still be able to spot that, uh, you know, that something unique in a case that somebody else would have missed just from your experience. When you came back to India, were you fully trained to be an independent transplant surgeon or you did hone the skills later on? Yeah, as far as the liver transplant and uh, cadaveric transplant is concerned, there was no doubt. I was uh, I actually from Birmingham, I moved to Leeds and in Leeds, uh, there were two young surgeons. Uh, in fact, one of them was actually younger than me who were consultant surgeons and he became a consultant surgeon because the person who was before him suddenly died at a, from a stroke very you know all of a sudden while he was giving a talk in one of the meetings and he became a surgeon very, at a very young age and at that stage uh, all of us we all almost kind of like you know we all of the same and all we wanted to become so I ended up doing lots and lots of surgeries there itself so in fact it, there would not be ever there there'd be a day when I would do three uh, kidney transplants in one day and liver transplant, in 95 I got the opportunity to do my first uh, liver transplantation and I remember this incident very well because I was scared that if I reperfuse because you know uh, there would be reperfusion injury and all sort of dangerous things will happen and then my bosses will not let me do another liver transplant. So, I insisted that my boss be called to the theatre and uh, Mark Bellamy, I remember him as well, he asked me, are you man or mouse? I said, I am mouse, but you call him just now. 
So, uh, Steve Pollard uh, with a lot of coaxing, he came into the theater and he came in his three piece suit. He entered the theater and <laughs> waited just as a reap of and then he walked away. But I think, uh, so as far as liver transfer is concerned, and uh, the, but then after coming here, because the cadaver donation those days still is scarce, even those days was even more scarce. And so, I, what we, what I started doing, I spent some time in Korea and then went to Japan and Hong Kong as well. But what I started doing was started doing the right hepatectomies in a donor way. So, I would not do inflow occlusion, the CUSA, mark the line. So, I developed the sort of donor skills by my HBB practice. Otherwise, it would have been very difficult. As far as the vascular work, because I used to be in charge of the vascular access list in Leeds, where twice a week I have to make the AV fistula, which I think is one of the most difficult surgeries to make because, you know, if the fistula were not only the patient upset with you, but the entire nephrology is very upset with you because you have botched the operation. <laughs> so, you have to make sure just to deal with those nephrologies, I have to ensure that my fistulas work in the post-operative period. Now, after how many years of after coming to India, did you become absolutely independent? So, I think in... Uh, as far as uh, HPB surgery was concerned, from the time I was there, I was doing independent, from the time I joined Gangaram. The first liver transplant I did 2001, which was uh, Dr. Nandi and me did it. Uh, and thereafter, we, when we started doing the living related transplant, we started doing one person donor, one person recipient, that's the way it go on. But soon, I think in, by 2006, 2005, I went to Hong Kong. And I came back and I saw them taking the middle hepatic vein routinely. And I, I used to be amazed by the progress of their patients uh, in the post hour. They'd be nursed on a sort of common ICU with the rest of the patients. Sometimes they're just, just given simple antibiotics augmented and they would just recover and go home. So I think uh, we introduced that practice as well. And in 2005, uh, there was a sea change in the outcome of patients. These patients then thereafter were, were kind of an autopilot. They just recovered, you did the operation nicely, didn't have too much blood loss and they would recover nicely. You could kind of also extubate them uh, next day morning. Uh, so I think, uh, but uh, as a, you know, but again what happened was every time there is uh, some stress point and we realized that uh, taking the middle hepatic vein was not so good for the donor. So we changed to uh, modified right lobe grafts and once I changed to modified, then again it took a little while to get, to be able to get the anti sector drainage right. So well, once we got that, then I think finally I can say now that, uh, you know, liver transplant, living donor liver transplant, reproducible, predictable operation. But now we have another stress point. Now we all have to do minimally invasive donor hepatectomy. So that is again, you know, adding to a new challenge. So I think the challenge is never finished. <laughs> yeah. So first, if you, uh, if I, I get it right, you've been educated, trained in a government institution. Then you're in the UK. Then when you came back, you say semi, sort of very, uh, or, or, or say. Mm. It is a private it's, hospital. It's a, it's it a looks private, like a government uh, uh, hospital. Uh, uh, yeah, but it's not exactly corporate hospital. Yeah, yeah it's but a trust hospital. When you are getting on to an independent mm -hmm. transplant surgeon, corporate medicine is new to you. Yes, yes. It's an extraordinary challenge. Yeah. One, you have to get a transplant going in circumstances in a country where this this is in the beginning stage and you are very new to corporate. Yeah. yeah. Uh, but that's an extraordinary. How did you face this challenge? Yeah, this is something that uh, obviously the corporate hospitals look at profit. So how much money they spent, what is their vita, what is their return. Whereas you doctors don't think of uh, uh, surgery as a as an income business, business. Yeah. you look at your job is to treat and if money comes well and good. So there is a big clash, but some of the problems created are by doctors themselves. Mm. So the two models doctors can get paid and both have their advantages and both have disadvantages. One is fee for service and the second one is where you are, uh, you know, uh, you are given, a, you negotiate with the hospital, you say, that I'll bring you so many patients and therefore you have to pay, give, give me this much. Now, if you are good and you bring that many patients, the hospital will pay you. They will know, you know, but the moment you underperform, they will start tightening the screws on you. 
So that's a big problem. So wherever I worked, uh, I made sure that I'm never under stress. I'm, I'm always been on a fee for service model. Mm -hmm. So if I work for, if I do five cases, I'm happy to get get the money for five cases. If I do ten cases, happy to. So there's nobody who can come and tell me, oh, we are paying you so much, and look, you are just enjoying and traveling and not doing any work. So that that is not there. The second conflict that comes, which is that. Uh, uh, if you are being paid a fixed amount, then what happens is that you will not do as much as you should be doing. You will do maybe fewer procedures, maybe you will put in f fewer hours. But if you are doing fee for service, maybe then you will do unwanted procedures like you know where there is a decision to be made whether you should do remove the appendix or not remove the appendix. If it's fee for purpose, you much rather choose removing the appendix rather than. So these are little clashes and both have advantages and disadvantages. So I, I think what uh, some of the uh, countries that uh, I've seen where uh, the, the health system, I mean I would say that health system has its problems everywhere. But I think the worst, uh, the, and I still think the NHS is probably the best because the guidelines and people are allowed uh, prior practice as a well, government work. I think those systems must come back again in our country. I think it's, you know, uh, to say that a, a person can only work in private sector and not in public sector, I think this is wrong. I think we should, uh, there's nobody who can be uh, influenced to move from a paying, ins uh, from a non-paying institution to paying institution. Uh, so this is the main fear that if the, uh, if you allow both, then what will happen is that the the private sector doctors will eat up all the uh, government sector. I don't think it's possible. You could uh, a doctor like uh, a doctor would like to be busy, like to be employed all the time, rather than waiting in the OPD to see when the next patient will come. So I think this uh, gradually this should come in again. And I've been sort of talking to government people and my old bosses. And I think that once you are done, uh, uh, particularly freshly trained, then I think it's important that you spend one or two years, three years in the same city where you want to practice in the government setup before you venturing out rather than going straight into practice. Because unless there are enough patients who are going to vouch for you, no matter how fancy degrees you have, nobody is going to take you unless they are. Medicine even now, even today is word of mouth. That's the best way of practice. And every single patient has, should have been told by someone close to them that he's had a good treatment by so-and-so doctor. Only then they'll come to you. So your question, Gangaram is a trust hospital. So Gangaram, uh, the trust hospitals also have a problem. It's not as if the corporate hospitals alone have a problem. I think the co corporate, uh, the trust hospitals have a problem that sometimes the pace of change is a bit slow. Whereas in a corporate hospital, if the because there's only one person in charge, is you know the CEO, the boss, whoever, and he feels that what you are saying is right, then he can bring about that change immediately. For example, I give you an example recently, about uh, two years ago, I felt that we should also go into robotic uh, uh, hepatectomy because everyone was doing it, and I said there's no way we can not be part of this because we'd be left behind if we didn't take this up. So I went to the boss and talked to him and I said, you know, uh, we would also like to do robotic surgery. And within a month, the robot was with us. Within a month. I was amazed. I thought, uh, this is, you know, I've just gone to talk to him. He'll say, no, drop a plan, how much cases, this, that. Within a month, it was there. Mm -hmm. They just installed it. And, uh, you know, so th that's how the pace of things can be there. When I was in Ganga, I'll, I'll tell you a very interesting uh, story. They wanted, I joined in 98 and I could only do the first transplant in 2001. To put the money, get the money together for all the liver transplant equipment, Dr. Sama was the chairman at that time, had a tough time because uh, he could not justify to trustees that if he spent so much money and say the program doesn't take off, then what happens? So, Dr. Sama being a very astute man, what he did was he allocated money to different departments anesthesia, gastroenterology, lab medicine, radiology and said all of them to you know. So actually the argon machine came from uh, gastroenterology budget because they could use it for argon doing APC of yeah. the mucosa. The retractor system came to the general surgery, the QSA system came, came under our department and similarly everything got distributed. So that's how we, we ended up getting the money for it. Otherwise, whereas in a corporate house, if the, if the, if you, if the one person is convinced, you can, uh, he can get things done immediately. But of course, 
the downside of course is if he doesn't like you he can fire you as well <laughs> <laughs> So the other thing I notice is uh, transplant is a teamwork, a huge team across specialities. And uh, when a team moves from one, one in the chief moves from one hospital, this hospital becomes empty. Do you have any guilt feeling that, okay, I'm emptying the hospital which nurtured me? How, what is, uh, how do you get over it? Okay, the very important point, but uh, actually whichever institution I've left, they, they have done better in transplantation particularly. So when I left Gangaram, they, it was, it, it did even better. Apollo Delhi when I left, they, you know, Nirav who was with us for many years actually doing an equally good job. And we have done in Max and hopefully when I sort of die from, die, because I am not hoping to move from here because, you know, I am now on the, you know, other side of 60. So, uh, uh, you know, I am pretty sure that Shalin will be able to take on the, uh, the fight or the struggle that you know we had in the beginning. So I, uh, but yes, sometimes it does happen. I have seen cases where the whole team moves from one place to another. But I think one of the problems which lot of surgeons have, particularly surgeons, they are always into this I, I thing that I have done this, I have done, I can do this faster, better. And I think uh, in the end of the day, disease is uh, Human beings are mortal, but disease is immortal. So unless you pass on the skills that you have developed to the next generation, I think you have failed as a doctor. Because you have not cure, you, your job is to bring about immortality and the only way you can do it by making sure that after you are gone, the diseases are still be left. So you have to train next people. It does not take you. In fact, if you look at many of the teams who are active in the country, Many of them have been associated with us and doing a, I must say, a much, much better job than what we did, what I was doing. Because obviously, they didn't have to go through the learning curve and they, they can quickly learn from the mistakes I made and they're doing much better job than what, that, than what we are doing now. That's great. But the, uh, what is it uh, that uh, attracts all your uh, uh, colleagues, your team to stick to you for yeah, long? Yeah, I think... Uh, if you write a paper, make sure the person has done the work as the first author. You should, even if your idea is yours, you've done all the sort of background work and you want, make sure the person has actually put the data together, analyzed it. Uh, although you may have heavily edited it, his name must be there first. Otherwise, he'll feel, you know, uh, he'll feel that his efforts are not being recognized. You must praise him at every opportunity. If there's a clinical meeting, then you should put forward his name rather than, you know, going for all the meetings. These are little things you do. Everybody, you know, you just, just because, uh, you know, uh, you are not presenting, people will not, will not forget that you, you are actually the driver. They, 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 will, they people are, will know themselves. But if you, if your team members, if you pushed them, then they will, uh, your team will stay together and keep their interests first rather than your own. So, I mean, what I do and I think uh, and I've discussed with G. V. Rao and uh, uh, Nag uh, Nagesh Reddy, they come first in the hospital, leave last. So, I also try and follow the same, reach first and be the last person to leave rather than, you know, leaving, expecting your other, your younger colleagues to sort things out for you. So, these are little things that but you can do to make a team at together. At this juncture, they come first, leave last. Uh, which I keep ask, often asking people who speak to, haven't they done injustice to their families and children? Yes, I think you may, you have a point there. But, uh, you know, in the end of the day, I, uh, I have very good relationship with my children. They all, you know, uh, I remember once I was operating and my wife could not be contact. My son was a bad asthmatic. So, I had to go to school and bring him to the hospital and bring him to the hospital. But you, whatever is needed, you need to do. But uh, whatever time you have, like for example, you know, I had twice, uh, I'm very fond of attending the ILTS meetings. So, three or four, four times, whenever I went, I ensured that my son or my daughter accompanied me. And in fact, some of the best times I've had was with them. So, I think uh, it's... You can make it up in other ways. That's what I'm saying to Cindy. It does not have to be on a day-to-day -day basis, but you could make it up in the long run. Yes, it does. It does happen like that. What you're saying, and sometimes maybe you, you know. 
particularly with daughters who sort of get married and go away, you feel. But uh, yes, it does happen to some extent. I have seen a lot of uh, uh, transplant groups, I, I should say group individuals, they borrow surgeons from, you know, somewhere in the north, somewhere in the south. They just come for that. What is this? I mean, I, I find it's very odd. Yeah, I think. Did you do that? In the beginning? Uh, we were, uh, yes, I think we helped a lot of teams do uh, work, uh, but we never, we only did it for government hospitals. Mm -hmm. So we did it first for ILBS, that was our first one. Then we did, took them through 25 transplants and they have a fantastic program now. We did this for uh, Calcutta University where I am from. Uh, Abhijit uh, Charge. No, the, your, what you do is a different thing. I am talking about corporate hospitals where, you know, I, I, for my hospital, for instance, if there is a transplant, there are two surgeons coming from elsewhere. No, I think that is. They, that are, they haven't seen the patient before and after. No, I think that, that has little bit to do with the way cadaveric donation is, uh, uh, organ allocation is happening. I think that has to be corrected. What is happening is that the hospitals which are licensed for transplantation, they get organs by rotation. Now that has to be corrected. So what happens is that, uh, so if for example today it's hospital A has to get the organ, hospital B has to get the organ. So hospital find this, so this is a system that is being exploited by the, I think uh, it may be wise, I mean of course we can debate it that in the end we should have a sort of a national list, if not a national at least a state list where the organ is uh, uh, allocated to an individual, not to a hospital. So then some of these problems that you are alluding to will stop because you know what happens is that uh, the counter argument to this of course is that uh, if the organ is not used in the hospital where it is donated, then organ donation rates will go down. But I am not sure whether that is true or not. But this is the counter argument to it that every hospital should be allowed to use the organ and therefore they end up uh, calling such. But I think that system needs a little uh, correction and uh, and obviously the some of the uh, hospital the transplant activity is so less the transplant surgeon would uh, we get bored if he does only he's in the payroll and you know he does only one but or two but that is a very common thing i was talking to dr rila is a good friend and uh, he was just he was saying that only few centers which do large numbers flourish. All others find it so, yeah, so difficult yeah, yeah. and there are so many of them. Yeah, uh, that is mainly for the, uh, uh, this system, uh, Dr. Rila should, because he is very close with the Tamil Nadu government, he should try and get this corrected. Organ allocation should not be to every hospital by rotation. Mm -hmm. It should maybe, you know, if a person is, it should so be That is a very significant statement what you make. It shouldn't be true every hospital. Better. That is what the, then every hospital will get licensed. I think in in Tamil Nadu, if I'm not wrong, the 42 registered transplant centers. Yeah, is it right? No, true. 42. So now, which means that if the, every organ has to rotate through, now there is no. I, I don't think there are 42 active liver transplant surgeons in the country <laughs> to say <save> Thailand. <laughs> <laughs> so, this has to be corrected. I don't know how, but it, it has to be corrected. The counter argument they say that if the whole, all the hospitals not working towards organ donation, they will not work towards organ donation if the organ that they are able to uh, uh, generate, uh, they are not allowed to use. So, but I don't know how we can find a balance between these two opposing views. But yes, this is particularly a problem with, uh, uh, this is in transplant surgery. And, but what we, uh, we have not uh, gone and done this uh, as a group. But yes, we have helped many centers and uh, and mean all, most of them be in government centers. We want them to really flourish. Well, what has happened, you know, is time and again you will hear statement, oh, your transplants are making a lot of money. Now, that is because we are, the, we are only transplanting in private sector rich people. And this also affects organ donation because, you know, if you see, look at transplant as a rich man's activity, the great sort of majority of people in this country are poor or middle class. So, they think that they will be, so I always keep saying that government hospitals must, must uh, push. Look at, uh, you know, in uh, Gujarat, I mean the 500 transplants very quickly. 
Why? Because before that IKDS was there, the kidney transplant was in a government hospital, donations were in a government hospital. So they have, I am told they now have one donation every day in, uh, in that uh, civil hospital in Ahmedabad. So unless the transplant active becomes uh, activity with the entire population, these problems will be there. And I think uh, government sectors, uh, so that was the main reason why we were pushing. And I'm glad to say that uh, of all, I mean, all the three places that we sort of been actively engaged in helping develop, they're all doing really well as far as transplantation concerned. The only one a little bit disappointed is Calcutta one is because they've not taken up living related, but they do disease donor liver transplantation, but they've not taken up uh, uh, living related transplant so far. Well, you're a very special friend of Pakistan. As far as transplant is concerned, what is that special relationship? The uh, special relationship is what uh, in the beginning, I think they had a huge hepatitis C burden. And uh, you know, unlike uh, doctors in India, we are a little bit, uh, you know, doctors there are, uh, they are uh, they're not easily accessible to their patients. It's a major difference I found. Whereas in India, I don't know whether you do it or now, but I still do it. If I'm free, if somebody rings me up, a patient, I'll give him advice that, you know, go and see somebody or take this or that. They're not. They will only see their patient in there if they've taken an appointment and come to see them at that time. So when I like started answering their phone call, they were like amazed. They never seen or heard anything like this. So. Th so, and you know, one patient came and then another came and another. So soon it, it was like a huge number started coming. And of course, for political reasons and visa, medical visas were banned. And but uh, and I, I still think that if we the government restrictions were to be lifted, we'd again have a lot of patients from there because uh, uh, their medical system and our medical system, although we've been sort of one nation in the past, but their medical system has developed in a different way than the medical system that has uh, developed here. I think the way. Uh, uh, Dr. Reddy, in, you know, first uh, got private sector up in the sort of news and Apollo Hospital. I think that has that is yet to happen in Pakistan. So, how did you keep pace with uh, the minimal access, the you know, uh, the robotic, the other things that happening in uh, transplant and with so many surgeons uh, advertising that we are doing this way? I mean, th is there yeah. all over the country actually? Yeah. Initially, I thought it would be a passing fad, so I didn't take much interest in it. I done lo I've done a lot of laparoscopic surgery, and I would wanted I, I, you know, I could have gone into laparoscopic. We did actually. We I took the steps in 2018. I got Sue to do a workshop. I don't know whether you did you attend that in one of the CLBs meetings. He came and did a workshop from our theatre, but that was the only time I was actually convinced that uh, laparoscopic. Uh, Donor hepatectomy is the right operation because he did it exactly the way we would do an open procedure. You know, he got all the veins and he did, uh, you know, nicely. But uh, after that, I think uh, uh, some of the equipment that he used, and I thought it was important for us to get those, you know, 3D and uh, endoflex uh, sort of uh, scopes. So that took a little while, and then we started. Lord Shalin from our group took a lot of interest. I used to just come and go in between and do a little bit. Uh, and then uh, I think the, uh, we saw this robotic thing and that also I think, uh, I actually didn't think we would ever get the robot because I knew it was a very expensive medicine, uh, equipment and my house. But the, the day I said it, within a month it was installed. So I thought that now well, on my word they have to uh, sort of install them, I must learn it. So it was actually, uh, I did spend a lot of free time with the simulator, so gained all the control. But actually once you start doing it, I'm sure you do as well, it's, you know, it's not nothing, nothing very, uh, in, not, you know, it's the initial thing, but once you start doing it, you realize it's, uh, there's more uh, noise than actual uh, difference from, you know, open surgery. But it has uh, done a lot of good things. One is that, uh, you know, uh, you can sit and operate, your shoulders won't get hurt and you can come and go when you want. You can answer phone calls in between. But I think uh, what must happen is uh, costs are still quite right. quite prohibitive. And I think we end up are, those who have a robotic end up paying 3.5 lakhs extra yeah. as compared to the open procedure. See, I always felt, but I always heard people say that uh, um, 
HPB surgery, uh, only 20% of the HPB malignancies are operable and even out of the 20% uh, uh, 20% live one or two years, it's a very dismal area. Um, still there are so, it's a very fashionable speciality. Uh, now my question would be, do you think a, trans, a surgeon who is taking up HPB should take up transplanted HPB or it should be separate? I think you have asked up something that is very dear to my heart. I think HPB and liver transplant should be together. Uh, the reason is that I, I don't know whether you listen to my talk, the many techniques of living donor liver transplantation that you can apply in HPV surgery. And uh, uh, yes, the many of these tumors you can't treat, but if your case selection is right and uh, uh, you know, uh, periampillary lesions, and I have many patients, although I don't have such a, a busy uh, pancreatic practice anymore as I used to have in the past. Uh, but many of uh, patients that I have operated on for pancreatic periampillary still alive 10, 10 years uh, after their uh, uh, surgery. And uh, liver tumors, I think particularly if you have a screening system in place, a surveillance system in place, then you can, we can be like the Japanese, pick them early and treat them. But uh, your specific question, should the HPB and liver transplant be separate? I think they should be t uh, together, but I think the existing people who are in GI surgery, who are in HPB, somehow don't want these specialities to come together, which is uh, which a little bit, uh, but I think in time it will correct itself. But uh, I think, uh, so what is happening to us now, I will tell you what is happening with us. So we are in actually in a very good situation because of this uh, reluctance uh, to uh, bring together HPB and liver transplant. What is happening to the people who are training in GSR, HPB elsewhere after the three years and they are fully trained, they all like to spend a year with us. And I have a huge waiting list of people, <laughs> very, very talented surgeons right. who are always wanting to come and join a unit just for a year because, you know. Uh, because they, they get a lot of exposure and they get a lot of skill. But I think, I have been trying, I have been written to the board, but I think somewhere along, everybody seems not in, all the senior people, uh, I have talked to all the students also and they feel that it should be, HPB and liver transplant should be together, but somehow, you know, for whatever reasons, uh, it is just not coming together. Uh, once we finish this, I can show you some, uh, you know, emails and things I have exchanged with colleagues, but they are not… Uh, How no many one. people touch your feet every day? No, uh, I actually, <laughs> I, uh, I would not like to answer that question, but yes, uh, 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 we uh, as a group, we have very good relationship with our patient. In fact, if, uh, uh, you know, if, if they ring us up in the middle of the night, either me or somebody from the department will take their call and, uh, you know, guide them up, uh, appropriately. Like so, this, uh, even at this, you know, even me, Charlene, or any cities, you know, they will just respond to them as if, uh, you know, they are like your own. So what is this uh, rivalry between you and Swain? Uh, there is no rivalry. We were actually batchmates together, we are good friends. Uh, but I think uh, uh, People t tend to, the, we are actually still very good friends, there is no, you know, we talk to each other. In fact, the Jaipur meeting that we are hosting would not have been possible if, uh, if uh, Dr. Rela, Soin and me were not, had not worked together. But yes, uh, uh, there are some difference of opinion and in clinical practice, for example, we are not fond of dual lobe transplants because I think uh, having three members of the family on the operating table the same day, <laughs> not a good idea according to me. Mm -hmm. Similarly, we have uh, other thoughts on uh, sequential versus combined liver and kidney transplant. So, so is that technical? It is not technical, yeah, it is just mostly difference in how we, really? uh, we approach <laughs> our patients. Mm. How much money is enough money? I think money has absolutely no meaning because most of the time you are in the hospital and if you get attending to conferences, somebody is paid for your hotel <laughs> bill. <laughs> so, money actually makes no difference uh, at all. Uh, but uh, yes, uh, sometimes what is fi finding a bit difficult, 
and lot of people are having this problem that for children's education they are having to shell out a lot of money which was not the case for my parents so you know this is a becoming a big issue and i think uh, i think we are probably uh, you know the educational loans and things like what it is in the west must come through because this is actually uh, the cost of professional education in this country is skyrocketing it right. is that is that one you know if you are successful you would also want people around you to be successful and you know you will but the college fees and all are getting really out of reach for most people what is ailing liver transplant in india i think one is that it is still uh, not recognized as successful speciality i just the other day i was having a conversation with a patient and he say uh, saying that my doctor said that i send nine patients to dr gupta and only eight uh, only one out of those nine uh, survived all the other eight died mm-hmm. after the operation so and this is actually i know that doctor i am not taking name but this is so this this has to change people look at things in their own perspective you always remember as a surgeon i'm sure you'll only remember the people that died but all the others who are doing well you not, not even know their names similarly for me all the transplant patients that who did not survive i'll remember but i'll not remember the names who had a smooth recovery they you know they're doing well but the one that you know something that you could have done better so the, i think we have to take it as a fact that we all are humans uh medical treatment is not 100% no medicine no medical uh, covid taught us all this that you know that med- medicine is not uniform similarly surgery is not cannot be absolutely uh, 100% accurate for everyone so we have to give we have to give uh, what we what the bclc people have used a treatment hierarchy and the treatment hierarchy as far as treatment of cirrhosis is concerned is at the moment transplantation not medicine I asked Dr. Nandi this question that, uh, you know, in, the, in that unit, uh, we all used to give marks to any presentation. And I asked him, how many marks would you give yourself? He said 9.5. <laughs> and uh, what, how many marks do you give yourself to your life till date? I think I could have done uh, many things better. But, you know, you're always a product of your background. And my product came at a very, uh, from very different background. So, you always had to play safe. so i could never take undue risks in life i had always make sure i one example i have to give you i'll give you and that'll probably make things very clear to you what i'm meaning so i had to take buy, uh, uh, get a flat for myself in delhi and the, the, i think the loan was about uh, 30 lakhs or something i was wondering if i die what will happen to my children so I actually took a insurance to pay <laughs> cover that <laughs> and ended up paying such high amounts of premium just to you know ensure that loan was paid just in you know so i could never take uh, you know undue uh, risks in life which i think you know and um, whereas my children you know they they are able to take very many uh, much uh, they may take more bold steps than i could uh, take in my because always worried that you know one wrong step it misfires then you are you know right at the bottom so but overall has been very satisfactory and if i had to give my marks i would say at least 7 Yeah. that's a very low mark <laughs> so much <laughs> oh well, i could have uh, i could have uh, maybe you know I, i i one thing i worry about is that although published lot of papers but i've not i think i'm not you know and that's again as we talked about earlier most of the papers have been published by my the my ideas the my thing but i've ensured that the first author is the person who actually done it so actually when you look at the list of a huge number my name will always be there but it'll probably be the last name not the you know the last uh, name is a honor oh yeah <laughs> well yeah but you you won't be you when you yeah, get yeah. quoted you won't get quoted That's by right, the, yeah. the you know uh, so but yes the so the maybe i could have you know but i've always been uh, keen that uh, the people uh, youngsters for them it matters much more than yourself i have lived my life so right. it, if they don't get the recognition that they deserve then it's that's you know, magnanimity yeah how do you unwind oh we have a great uh, social life and uh, whenever we travel uh, whenever i have a meeting like this time uh, usually because both all the children are grown up so usually travel with my wife and we like uh, last uh, two weekends ago we was in naples and we sort of after the meeting which was a minimally invasive donor uh, hepatectomy we traveled uh, to amalfi coast and pompeii which is a beautiful city so that's a good way to pass time 
and I think, uh, of course, uh, watch a lot of television and movies. As far as games is concerned, I used to be very uh, uh, sort of squash player, but after a little while what happened was that sometimes you'd get some backache and as a surgeon, you you know, sometimes it became a bit difficult. I remember once I did a full list with my back completely aching mm. all the time. So then I went on to yoga, which I do regularly every day. And I think uh, the best uh, gift that a surgeon or a clinician is to, if someone uh, comes and says that, uh, you know, you cured me, that, that is by itself great, great unwinding words, if I can use that phrase. Thank uh, you. What are you planning for your future? I think uh, hopefully I have a dream that we'll end up uh, having a, a dedicated liver unit with, uh, uh, you know, with all the components of it there. Uh, and also uh, something, you know, I, I really admire Dr. Sarin for that, for having set up ILBS. Uh, something similar, but uh, with more uh, sort of uh, international. So we do we're doing a lot of work with uh, some centers in per, uh, Portugal who are looking at a biopsy slide, some centers in Calcutta who are looking at a slide, uh, you know, HCC work. But sometimes I would want an institute where there's, a, there's stress on. Uh, there's no stress on publication, but stress on genuine work. Majority, you know, I'll tell you, if you look at some of the things that we published and we've talked about, they've stood the test of time. Initially, there was a lot of reluctance to what we said. For example, I can tell you this 650 gram business about, uh, you know, graph, absolute graph volume versus ratio. Many of, of my colleagues will not agree, but secretly you ask them, they're all doing the same now. So all, some of the things that we didn't publish, they stood the test of time. We haven't done publication for publication sake. So we would like an institute where problems are recognized, actual problems are recognized and a treatment, you know, something uh, is done. Not, not for the purposes of uh, uh, name and fame, but more sort of rooted to the, you know, ground and actually recognizing the problem for what it is and for example you know for, if i were to tell you why why is uh, disease donation so poor, poor in the country now you know if a chap comes to the hospital he's a young fellow he had a road traffic accident hospital charging him 30 10 lakhs 15 lakhs or then some coordinator comes and says donate your organ now how the hell is he is he in a frame of mind to even think about that request right so some things have to change it has you know, it should be automatic. If I go and tell, you know, the government should come out with a statement that, you know, anybody who donates organs, their hospital will, will be waved off. Something, there has to be, you know, if I were to go and say that, or, you know, they, they'll be say, they'll accuse me of, uh, you know, commercial transaction. So, some things have to be done for, which is not just for name and friend, but for somebody which is actually looks at the problem in, the, in a proper manner and then gives the solution. But I think, uh, but yes, I'm keen that uh, we should have, there, there are a group of li like-minded people who are keen to ensure that uh, genuine care, not care that is, uh, you know, that this particular treatment is best. Even if it is, for example, I don't know how much you will agree with me, know, with me now, but I still think the open Liechtenstein repair <laughs> with a, you know, is much, much better, serves the purpose much better than laparoscopic hernia repair. But what everyone is getting, laparoscopic hernia yeah. repair. True. So something, you know, there has to be some, somewhere, so, you know, I have two friends. One, of course, went to, on to have laparoscopic hernia repair. One, I did his, his hernia repair myself because he, he had more faith in me. That person went to office the next day, mm. you know. So some things have to change, not just, and I don't know how that will happen, but unless the institution which gives that message, I think we will end up doing even more and more complicated things without, you know, just to prove that one is technique is superior to the other. So that's what I hope for in the future. On that note, it's wonderful talking Thank to you, us. Thank you. Thanks for spending time with us. And <laughs> it was really long. Yeah? We are off recourse. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. Thanks. Thank you.